Alright guys, welcome back. This is Unit 3 of the Lecture Notes. This week we're going to be talking about purchasing follow-up, uh, storage, payment, and evaluation. Uh, and that's evaluation of the uh, purchasing process and the goods bought. So, uh, with purchasing follow-up, and we, we have to kind of take a step back. Uh, what we're assuming with purchasing follow-up is that we have already ordered these products uh, and we are about to receive those products in. So um, that's, that's where the conversation starts. Uh, so we need to look at who is going to receive those products uh, when, a, when a delivery is made. So you're receiving personnel. Um, we need to look at them for certain things. So uh, one, they need to be able to maintain uh, sanitation standards. Uh, it's really important throughout the uh, uh, delivery and storage process and, and also issuing. Um, have knowledge of appropriate technology, uh, whether that is for, to, for invoicing, uh, for payment, for ordering, uh, whatever their responsibilities and uh, the, the technologies that their responsibilities include, they need to be to know how to use that technology appropriately. Uh, have the necessary physical strength um, and when you're ordering groceries in bulk like we do in the food service industry uh, sometimes that necessary physical strength is quite a bit um, if we look at how we order things like flour sugar butter potatoes onions things like that uh, minimum case weight is 50 pounds uh, a case of number 10 cans uh, they're somewhere around eight to ten pounds a piece and there's six of them in there so they, they can get pretty heavy heavy you know a case of beef uh, can get uh, up to 90 pounds so uh, having the, the appropriate physical strength to be able to handle those deliveries and, uh, and storage is really important uh, must be able to resolve problems this is a really big deal because oftentimes when uh, deliveries are made uh, there are issues with those deliveries, whether it's uh, a product being out or a case being damaged. Uh, that receiving personnel needs to know how to handle those problems on the spot without always having to go get a supervisor. Now, granted, some issues would require that a supervisor step in and either uh, handle the problem or make appropriate phone calls, but um, those receiving personnel uh, really need to know how to uh, navigate I issues that may arise, especially simple issues that are fairly common, like a, a damaged case of eggs or a, a ripped bag of flour, things like that, or you know, receiving the wrong item, wrong quantity, or if, uh, if you're charged differently for uh, an item than what you were quoted. So those are all really important things. Um, and then maintaining a concerned attitude. If you, if you have a bad attitude towards the process, um, things are gonna slip through the cracks and if you don't care, why would you uh, say something about a, a damaged case of eggs or a torn bag of flour? So that concerned attitude is really important. Uh, so for effective receiving, these, this is kind of a checklist of what of things that should be done, uh, and this is like a bare minimum. Uh, compare the delivery invoice with the purchase order, uh, because you should have that purchase order written down, and that is the list that you ordered from. And then the delivery invoice is what that delivery personnel is going to bring in. You should be able to match those two things up uh, with pricing, amounts, quantities, qualities, specifications. All of those things should be in line. Um, and you're going to look for things like product quantity. Uh, if you ordered six cases of eggs, uh, you you know it don't accept five. Um, and then also purchase unit price. Uh, oftentimes uh, prices fluct in the market market will fluctuate, um, and they will automatically uh, go up. Uh, and you just need to point that out to your. Uh, your representative or your driver and they can make quick adjustments on that but you know pennies count um, confirm the product quality does it meet the specifications that you require if you so if you're ordering USDA prime beef and they bring in choice or select don't accept it it's not the quality that you're asking for um, and you know ready to pay for so they need to get you what you order uh, you sign the delivery invoice. It's a big deal. A lot of times um, drivers will be in a rush. 
receiving personnel will be in a rush and those things can get uh, left undone. Um, and really by signing that report, it says that you're taking responsibility for the, the state of that order from that point forward. Um, so you better check it well and then put your name on it uh, so that there's a, a chain of accountability behind that. Um, issue credit memo if necessary. That's a, um, that what a credit memo would would pertain to is if a, if there's damage to items um, or there's something is shorted or unacceptable, uh, you send that back and they would issue a credit memo. Now, what dr most drivers have the uh, ability to do is make a, an adjustment on the invoice. Um, so a credit issue a credit uh, memo does not have to be issued. Um, but it just depends on who you're dealing with and make sure you have that information. Um, and then move the product to storage. Uh, after the product has been uh, moved to the appropriate storage areas, uh, then you need to complete a receiving report. And a receiving report, we do them at this school, uh, can be as simple as a couple of sentences. All products were received in a, 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 at proper temperature and you know that's one of the things you need to be checking is your product temperatures uh, uh, at, at the appropriate time uh, no shorts uh, damaged case of eggs received uh, credit on the invoice it could be that simple um, sometimes they're a little more extensive uh, so that receiving report really helps you do the evaluation that we're going to talk about in a little bit so next we're going to talk about storage um, so Products, uh, if you look through the commissary, are stored in different areas uh, just because those different areas are accommodating to th those particular products. Uh, we have the produce walk-in uh, that we keep the fresh produce in and the carts, and then the other walk-in is for miscellaneous items, dairy, eggs, and proteins. Um, so. And then we have the dry storage area, the liquor cage, uh, all of those different areas that we can we can store in, uh, uh, along with the chemicals. So everything has a place. That's that's the that's the important thing. Um, and in your restaurant or whatever concept that you have, um, that that kind of appropriate storage area uh, is vitally important. A lot of restaurants, uh, or I see a lot of students submit concepts that they're. They only want to use reach-in refrigerators. Um, that gets really tricky very fast. Um, I understand it's a theoretical concept, uh, but really, uh, even if it's a small operation, you need to have plenty of space to put products in. Say you get a big order or a catering job or you have a large party coming in and you don't have space to store the product that you need to uh, to uh, commit, that, commit to that function, you're kind of dead in the water at that point. So, um, let's move into this. Uh, so deliveries must be done quickly and at appropriate times. Avoid rushes. We talked about that. Uh, you know, keeping those delivery windows pretty tight uh, so that you don't have a delivery guy showing up during your lunch rush or whatever. Um, and then, and you don't want to do that when receiving person personnel are unable to attend to the deliveries uh, because very few places just have receiving personnel. Uh, it's usually a trained uh, member of, of the staff. Uh, that works in another capacity, whether it's a sous chef, executive chef, prep guy, it, it doesn't matter, but you, you don't want to have them be in the weeds and then have to stop and take a delivery. Um, adhere to quality standards in terms of time and temperature. That means check everything uh, for temperature when it arrives and try to get it put away as quickly as possible so that those temperatures don't go into the danger zone. Uh, be it for frozen mm -hmm. products, you really don't want those products uh, coming above 30 degrees uh, because then you start to have thawing take place and, and so on. Um, so it needs to be done quickly. Allow only staff of intermediate or advanced standing uh, to sign for the, the deliveries uh, because each of those deliveries represents money. Um, and I've seen a lot of restaurants lose a lot of money because product is going out the back door. Um, they let whoever receive it uh, and then you know there goes a, a case of whatever uh, out the back door so um, you need to let people uh, sign for those that you trust all right um, and they should also be trained in accepting or accepting those items uh, with regards to your quality standards um, 
So they need to be able to scrutinize produce orders or dairy or, what, or, or protein orders to make sure that they meet your quality standards, okay? Um, so uh, the frequency of deliveries is the next thing we're gonna talk about. So, and, and a lot of this goes to how perishable those are, items are, how quickly they're gonna lose their quality uh, under normal storage conditions. So for uh, fresh fish, um, you may wanna have that de delivered daily, especially if your concept revolves around fresh fish, if that's one of your signature um, platform items, you know, uh, a variety of fresh fish, you might want that delivered on a daily basis. Um, produce daily for delicate, uh, weekly for bulk and hearty vegetables, and bulk and hearty vegetables would be things like potatoes, onions, carrots, uh, that have relatively good keeping qualities. Um, and that would, and these frequencies of delivery are also gonna help you um, adjust your orders appropriately. So if you're ordering 50 pounds of carrots, and they're sitting in your walk-in for a month and they look like dish sponges by the time you get to them, uh, maybe cut those, those orders back, have a, have a case broken for you, or find another use for carrots, right? Um, so for specialty produce, we, we may want to order that daily, um, just according to how well it keeps up and you would kind of get that experience and how, how much you're using and how, you, how well it stores for you. Um, meat two or three times a week depending on usage and storage um, most meats uh, have relatively good keeping qualities um, even poultry now uh, you're able to uh, get poultry in and keep it on ice uh, for a week or uh, or even freeze part of it uh, this really doesn't go to you know, freezing because if once you start freezing products uh, the keeping qualities are much much longer uh, and then dairy it says here at least twice a week um, and that also goes to usage and storage capacity um, advantages of weekly deliveries so if you um, kind of not disregard everything we just talked about but if you kind of look at um, I only want to get deliveries once a week from a, a particular vendor or all of my deliveries once a week. Some There are advantages. You can get price deliver, price breaks for bulk deliveries, right? Um, you get all your products at once, uh, say on a slow day, um, you might get a price break uh, for ordering, ordering it all at once. And more and more what trucks are doing is if you don't, or distributors are doing, is if you don't meet a minimum case number on their order, uh, they will charge. They will charge you uh, 30 bucks if you don't order 30 cases or more of something. So um, that's definitely information that you want to get from your vendor uh, before you start ordering from them. What are do you have case minimums on weekly orders or daily orders? So <clears throat> what that really does is it prohibits a lot of smaller restaurants from getting into sloppy uh, ordering practices where they need two cases of this one day and then two cases of something else the next day. So if they're paying a premium for that, they're more than likely to get it together and um, order appropriately, all right? And then your receiving staff, this is another benefit of ordering weekly, your receiving staff <coughs> um, only really need to you know, concentrate on that for that delivery time. They're not doing it several times a week, they're doing it for an extended period of one day a week, all right? So receiving procedures, um, appropriate procedures include accepting or rejecting delivered food. Um, and that's by following the standards uh, that you set up as, uh, as an organization, uh, because the standards that you have are gonna determine what products you order. Uh, and if those products don't meet the standards that you set up, um, then those need to be either rejected, uh, swapped out, whatever the case is. Um, so go through the entire order, verify that the product's coming in complete and meets your specifications. Don't just look at the top layer, um, you need to go through it. And that means opening cases, checking temperatures, doing things like that. And really importantly, checking weights, especially on proteins. Uh, when rejecting foods, we need to follow some things, uh, follow some criteria as well. So reject the product if it's damaged, and receive the credit memo or that immediate uh, invoice uh, adjustment, notify the vendor of the situation, uh, especially if it happens periodically. You don't wanna let something slide uh, that maybe your uh, the company needs to know about if it's consistent. 
Um, note the rejected product uh, in your on the purchasing order, the invoice, and then on your receiving memo. Uh, receiving memo. Uh, notify the manager of the restaurant, and then also let the manager know when that product is back in stock and the situation is revolved. Because until that situation is resolved and not revolved, um, you you might be short on a product for service. So um, the the time it's a very timely kind of exercise. So put away the food promptly and in the correct manner. And this is a lot of stuff that we're going to hear from safety and sanitation um, with a little more detail. So maintaining uh, cleanliness and safety of the receiving area. Um, I. So we're going to talk about storage um, conditions. So freezers should be kept at zero or below. Um, coolers, uh, refrigerators should be kept at 41 degrees or lower. And then your dry storage area should be at 50 to 70 degrees uh, with a relative humidity of 50 to 60 percent. Okay, so those are really specific criteria for refrigerators, freezers, and dry storage areas. Um, follow product rotation. Uh, first in, first out. Um, label products. Uh, if you break open a case, you should write on everything that was in that case, the date that it came in. Say if it's number 10 cans of tomato sauce, write on the can with your Sharpie, uh, case opened uh, June 7th, right? Um, rotate perishable products out uh, and go through them when you're rotating. If something is spoiled out, get rid of it and log that item and inventory products regularly, all right? Um, maintaining a perpetual inventory, uh, beginning inventory each day, and th this perpetual inventory uh, can be a little complex for restaurants, but it works really well on a, on a line situation setting. So uh, beginning inventory each day is the ending inventory of the previous day. So if you are on your line, say you're making chicken sandwiches and you have to have breaded chicken breasts, uh, you go through average 12 a day um, and you go in in the morning to do the station inventory and you have four left, that tells you per that perpetual inventory that you need to prep up eight more. Um, that will also help you get a better handle on your ordering of that product if you know your regular usage, right? Know what that perpetual inventory is telling you. Some days may be heavier usage. Uh, some days may be lighter and that would also help you uh, get your ordering scheme together as far as what days should I be ordering this what day you know what days uh, am I going to need this product by for sure um, and what days could I get away with what I have on hand so that's just a, a, a quick thumbnail of the uh, perpetual inventory only as it pertains to a station a particular station ingredient you probably wouldn't be doing uh, a daily inventory in all of your products however you may do that for heavy use items um, just depending on you know what your concept needs all right so obtaining maximum shelf life from perishable goods is a huge deal so um, product rotation and uh, proper storage is a is huge um, and going through those items to see if there's spoilage and removing anything that's spoiled because oftentimes that can spread and cause an entire batch to go bad when just a, a minor intervention can save a bag of salad greens for service. All right, next we're going to talk about payment. Um, so uh, payment uh, is expected and a lot of restaurants get into hot water with their vendors because they don't pay in a timely manner. Now the, the way that payments are set up is uh, depending on uh, your standing with that company and maybe a credit rating, whatever the case is, they may give you 30, 60, or 90 days to pay these invoices, right? Um, or you may get a statement once a month with everything you've, that you've bought in, that, in the previous 30 days. Um, so you can pay it by invoice or by statement. Um, if, when restaurants get into hot water, what, and by, from not paying on time, what, the, what your vendors will start doing is demanding a check when you receive those goods um, or cash. Uh, and that's in like the worst case scenario, but the, you know, going for, it'll go from 90 days to 60 days if you're not paying in time, and then from 60 days to 30 days, and then from 30 days to two weeks. And, you know, they'll keep uh, putting, you know, clamping down on you until you get, to, get them their money in time. 
Uh, they're delivering the groceries, so they need to get paid. Um, so by remember, by invoice, you're going to pay per each particular invoice, right? Um, you would sit down, uh, maybe add them up uh, for a period of time, and then cut a single check, or you cut a single check for each one. Um, sometimes these uh, are the vendors are linked to your account. You you have a bank account uh, that they draw from every time that they they drop uh, an order for you. Uh, they love that because they get paid as soon as those uh, products are delivered. Um, and, and that's more of the modern type banking uh, setup that we're seeing in the restaurant industry these days. And that's kind of what we do at the school, but we set it up for, in a very particular way because we're uh, we're dictated by the, the state says how we can pay our vendors. Um, and then by statement process, uh, we, they process the documentation, uh, including delivery invoice that's filed by the supplier, uh, and then you pay it all at once, right? So it could be a, a group of invoices from usually a 30-day period, all right? So just keep that in mind. You don't want to get in hot water with your vendors. Next thing we're going to talk about is evaluation. Um, and this is uh, the purchasing evaluation. So uh, what we need to do is have purchasing goals. We talked about that a couple weeks ago or last week. What are the goals of our purchasing program? Uh, that can be uh, to, to not go into the red as far as money goes uh, for, uh, for products. It, it can be uh, a particular, a targeted sales amount for a period of time, say you know, $25,000 of sales for the quarter. Right, uh, but whatever those purchasing goals are, uh, we need to have them on paper. We need to have, they need to be real and tangible rather than just saying, okay, well, I'm going to order these products and then I'm going to pay for them, and that's my purchasing goal is to get that product in. It's not quite how that works because we we need to evaluate our whole system, like uh, your project assignment from last week. What is your purchasing system going to look like? Is it going to be a combination of ride the market and uh, cash and carry, or whatever the whatever your system is? You need to have clear goals as to how that is going to work for your business and so that you maximize your your income uh, and your revenue right so uh, developing those purchasing goals um, then we need to measure actual performance um, and that can be measured in in several ways uh, the money that we spend to bring in the products um, a lot of uh, food service institutions will keep uh, waste sheets and these waste sheets will tell a manager um, if product has been thrown out or uh, spilled, whatever, or gone missing even. Um, and that's one way to measure performance, right? Because each product that either you give away in the dining room, that is dropped on the floor, that spoils out, thrown out, or grows legs and walks away, um, that represents money. So. Uh, measuring actual performance without those indi without those numbers is erroneous, right? So measuring actual performance, how is that purchasing program holding up? Compare the actual performance to the goals, and then you might need to take corrective actions. Uh, those corrective actions would be things like uh, maybe ordering less dairy because we're seeing more spoilage than we want on fresh milk products, uh, whatever the case is. Uh, oftentimes corrective actions are relatively simple. Sometimes they can be really tricky and hard because they involve disciplinary procedures or firing people, um, whatever the case is. Um, and then you're gonna evaluate those results, all right? So I know that's kind of a complicated process, but it's really simple and it starts with, what are my goals for my purchasing program? And then you go through those steps to measure the performance, right? Compare the actual goals, the, actual performance with those goals, take corrective actions, and then see if those results work. You break it down like that, and it's a pretty simple process, but, and that needs to be done periodically. Maybe you want to do that monthly when you do your inventory, which is a really, really good time to do that. Maybe you want to do it quarterly, uh, you know, every four months or every uh, three months, whatever, um, or every biannually, every six months, or annually. Uh, I probably wouldn't wait to do something like that on a yearly basis because uh, it might just, you know, it might have really bad results. You might be shocked at what you find. So um, evaluation is a huge part of the process. All right. Uh, so that's it for this week. Uh, we need to talk about the project assignment for the week, and I'm going to open this up. 
So project assignment number three. So you're gonna create a purchase requisition including all food and non-food items. So this is gonna be based on your master ingredient list, right? This is part of your master ingredient list. However, the way we're breaking this up is we are breaking it up by vendors. If you're buying everything from one vendor, really what you can do is create another column. Like I said, you want this in an Excel spreadsheet, create another column, and then you're gonna put your vendors on there. And then you're gonna create a separate sheet, and I've, I've uploaded some requisition uh, on the samples of requisitions uh, with the assignment this week. Uh, that you can use. So you, if it, you know, you're getting your dairy and meat from Cisco, um, the the vendor name would be Cisco, and then you would put all of your dairy and meat items on there. Now for this uh, assignment, you need to have the description of the item, and that means the product specs, um, the quantity or pack size, how it's sold, uh, and how you're buying it. Right. So if you're buying meat uh, that you know comes in a 50 pound case. Uh, great that that's the quantity or the pack size but if you're buying you know 20 pounds of it they're, they're having to break it open then I need to know that as well the unit price and the amount needed right so you need to develop these product specifications so uh, so the purchase requisition is going to have a lot of information on it but that information should also be on your master ingredient list very very important uh, I have uploaded uh, as in the, the weekly uh, in, in the weekly overview a bunch of documentations with price lists and specifications uh, so there's a couple from Cisco there's one from Costco there's one from Segovia's produce uh, so there's a lot of information there you need to start developing that master ingredient list out with those specifications prices uh, so that you can use those in your recipes uh, remember uh, the the master ingredient list the, and the cost cards with the recipes, standardized recipes included, are all due in a couple of weeks. So uh, you need to continue to work on that. Um, if you don't have those in a couple of weeks, you're probably you're really in in, in hot water, uh, just because of the fact that that is the cornerstone of your entire project. All right. So keep that stuff in mind. Let me know if you have questions, and I'll see you guys at the class meeting.